So uh, welcome everyone, uh, welcome to this session. So this is uh, session two uh, with the topic of shapes and moments of distributions. Uh, we covered some basic definitions the last time. Uh, today we should discuss much more intuition. Uh, I would like to provide some pictures based on actual data here. And well, I would like to also explain a little bit more intuition behind the diff different definitions. Uh, we spoke ma mainly about moments the last time. So there will be more intuition about moments. Uh, then I would like to also mention characteristics of distributions that are not moments. And uh, specifically, like one of the very important characteristics that uh, you don't actually hear about that much is uh, the tail index of distribution. So we will talk about the tails of distributions. We will talk about uh, some extreme events and stuff like that. So this will be close to the end of the session today. Uh, but uh, at the beginning, I will provide some recapitulation of what we had the last time. And then let's uh, build some more intuition for the moments of distributions. And after that, uh, we can proceed. Um, maybe just a quick reminder, uh, if you haven't signed up uh, for the whole lecture series, uh, here is a sign up form. So you can just uh, fill out this form and uh, you will receive information about how to get access uh, to the different uh, materials. Uh, and again, there was uh, this uh, full lecture course, uh, rigorous introduction to probability theory. So that one you can find on YouTube already. I got a question about a textbook. So I included a link here to one particular textbook. Um, so you will be able to uh, follow that link. Uh, but uh, the thing is, uh, this uh, course or the course series is not based on any particular textbook. It's just uh, for those of you who want to follow things from some other sources. Uh, yeah, there will be some uh, quizzes and uh, assignments. So I haven't posted them yet but they will be posted in this particular section, uh, quizzes and assignments uh, a little bit later. Um, yeah, again, you will be able to find it in the post-it notes. And now, yeah, let, let me remind you of the concept of expectations of random variables. Uh, so very quickly, if we have, yeah, I should say here, we will come back to the big definition of expectations that would work for any random variables. Um, yeah, but the last time I provided just two separate definitions, one for discrete random variables, one for continuous random variables. So for uh, discrete random variables, we had this particular definition uh, using a sum and the sum contains uh, the, the values that the random variable can take times the probabilities. So it's like a weighted average of the values of the distribution uh, where the weighting corresponds to probabilities. And uh, yeah, you can definitely think of it as the average value and that the random variable takes in here. If you have continuous variables, we had this kind of definition using an integral. It's analogous, but uh, yeah, uh, this particular formula is well suited for continuous distributions that have some PDF uh, P in here. So we can have more general definitions later on. Yeah, I mentioned that uh, the expectations may not exist. So the sum or the integral may be ill-defined and uh, we will see that in practice. So some of the distributions we work with have expectations, have moments, some, some of them don't have uh, and so on and so on. So this was uh, the concept of expectations. And then we went to the moments of distributions. So moments, uh, again, uh, were characteristics of the shapes of the distributions. Uh, some, something that you can easily communicate to someone else. Maybe you tell them uh, what is the standard deviation of the random variable, what is the skewness, and, and stuff like that. Uh, we had this particular general definition in here. So this was the nth moment about value C. And yeah, so, so nth moment of the uh, random variable X about value C. So this was defined using this expectation here. 
and the value c it's something that you choose um, if you want to have a row moment uh, c would be equal to zero as you see here if you have a center moment uh, the c would be equal to the mean of the random variable so um, the mu in here that you see is uh, the expectation of the random variable x so it's uh, up to you which moment you want to talk about uh, I had a formula here for discrete random variables. I had a similar formula here for continuous random variables that have some PDF uh, P in here. And uh, again, you can think of these moments as some weighted averages. So here, for example, for the discrete random variable, uh, we take the possible one possible value uh, that X can take. Uh, we subtract C. We raise it to the power of n, we multiply by the probability, and then we sum it all up. So that's going to give us a weighted average of x minus c uh, to the power of n, where the weights correspond to the individual probabilities. So I have some more pictures related to this, uh, because, uh, yeah, uh, it's actually maybe easier to understand things if you uh, take a look at pictures. But before that, uh, let me take a look at the chat. Um, yeah, so uh, a question here says, how often do we choose a moment centered on something other than the mean? And uh, the answer is, typically you would choose either the mean or you would choose zero. Uh, but of course, uh, you can also compute other moments. Maybe, maybe you have actually two different uh, random variables and uh, then you may be interested in the moment of the second random variable um, centered around the mean of the first random variable. Yeah, it depends on the situation, but uh, definitely uh, these situations are more rare, right? Typically we would choose uh, C equal to zero or C would be equal to the mean of the distribution. And uh, yeah, we also talked about some other interpretation of uh, the moments. And we talked about the fact that you can compute the moments also for samples. So if you have a sample of observations, xj here, uh, you again calculate x minus c to the power of n and you average it this time over the whole sample. So these were some of the definitions. And um, yeah, I kind of uh, wonder in which order I should do this. So, so maybe I should uh, just uh, remind you of the different concepts and then uh, let's take a look at pictures. Let's uh, take a look at the individual contributions to these different moments that come from different portions of the distribution. So quickly, uh, we can have an expectation or expected value or the population mean, uh, something that we discussed already. But uh, yeah, this time you can think of it as the first moment where C is equal to zero. So it's the uh, raw moment, first raw moment. So this would be mu for us. Uh, we can talk about variance. And uh, that's the second moment. Uh, it's a central moment. And it's uh, defined by uh, this formula right here. Um, yeah, the standard deviation, that would be the square root of the variance. And uh, we also like really briefly talked about normalized central moments and skewness and kurtosis. Uh, this should be actually like a big topic for today's discussion. So if you have normalized moment, uh, you would take the ordinary moment and you would divide it by a certain power of the standard deviation. So yeah, the formula is right here. Uh, you take the moment, if it's the nth moment, then you divide it by standard deviation to the power of n. Uh, we should talk about the, the reasoning behind this um, in a couple of minutes. And yeah, I said that skewness was uh, this normalized third central moment. Uh, here I'm denoting it gamma. And uh, then kurtosis was the fourth central normalized moment uh, that would be the kappa right here. And maybe let, let me briefly mention that if you calculate this for the normal distribution, 
uh, then you get uh, kurtosis equal to three. So then we can speak of excess kurtosis, which would be simply the kurtosis minus three. So we are measuring devi deviations from normal distribution in this case. So these were some of the definitions that I said very briefly at the at the end of the last meeting. Now let's try to understand what's behind all of this. Uh, okay, I'm getting a question. Uh, why isn't the standard deviation the first center moment? Uh, instead, it, it is the square root of variance. And uh, yeah, the, the answer is that uh, if you just compute the first central moment, then you would have basically the expectation of x minus mu, which is also the expectation of x. So you would get actually zero. So th there would be uh, no information in this. Uh, every distribution, if it has a first moment, uh, then uh, the first central moment is equal to zero. So really, we have to go beyond that. Uh, we have to consider the second moment and then we take the square root. It's just a standard def definition. So, so yeah, uh, th thanks for the question. And another question, uh, why do we need to normalize a central moment? And the answer is we don't necessarily have to, cent uh, we don't necessarily have to normalize it. Uh, but uh, it is actually convenient to normalize it. I wanted to talk about this a little bit later, but uh, now that we asked, maybe this is actually a good time uh, to discuss this particular thing. So why, why would we actually go and divide here by the nth power of the standard deviation? So, so does uh, anyone have suggestions why that may be or... Uh, yeah, you, you can use the chat here to type your answers if you have an answer. Yeah, is there something particularly convenient about uh, dividing here by sigma to the power of n? Okay, and... Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, some, some answers here. Let me catch up on that. So uh, to get your original units, and yeah, it does have to do with units in which you, ca you can measure things. And uh, let, let me read through the answers uh, first and then uh, let me respond. Um, another response here, uh, we may be comparing similar distributions. Okay, another one. Uh, because we want to know about the shape and uh, by normalizing we get a good idea of uh, kind of the shape characteristics. Uh, we want this to be dimensionless and uh, yeah, another person emphasizing here the fact that we want this to be dimensionless. Uh, exactly, so it is uh, some, th something related to units for sure. If you have uh, X that has some dimension, maybe a physical dimension, maybe uh, X corresponds to the temperature, uh, then uh, the expected value of X squared, for example, would be would have units of Kelvin, Kelvin squared. If you have the third moment, uh, it would be Kelvins to the power of three and so on, right? So then if you calculate these moments that are not normalized, uh, then the value of the moment is going to depend on which units you choose. Uh, so it's going to depend on whether you measure things in Kelvins or Celsius or Fahrenheit. Um, yeah, if you have currencies in here, it's going to depend on whether you consider, say, US dollars or Japanese yen and, and so on. So uh, this uh, unit dependence of the moments is inconvenient if you want to talk to someone else and tell them something about the shape of a distribution. Uh, it's actually much better if you create some variable um, like the skewness or kurtosis that does not depend on the choice of units. And yeah, you, bas we, you basically get rid of the units here by multiplying by sigma to the power of n. 
And uh, yeah, so these uh, moments, uh, these uh, normalized uh, nth central moments, they are not going to depend on the units in which you measure things. Uh, so a linear uh, rescaling is not going to affect these. And then it actually makes, uh, makes life easy. Uh, it's uh, easy to compare distributions, even for random variables that actually have different units in the particular example that you consider. And uh, yeah, also uh, we are talking here about the central moment. So the mean is subtracted, which means that uh, not only the rescaling, but also shifts of X are not going to affect the moments. And uh, then, yeah, if you convert temperature uh, from Celsius to Fahrenheit, uh, you know that it's a linear transformation. It includes shift, it includes uh, rescaling, uh, but it is not going to affect the skewness or kurtosis uh, if you have some observations of temperature. So yeah, this, this is uh, why we divide by sigma to the power of n and also uh, why we subtract the mu in here. Uh, then we can meaningfully talk about the shapes. Um, all right, so that's uh, some something I definitely wanted to cover today. Uh, but uh, does anyone have any questions related to this? If not, uh, I want to go back here to the case of variance. So the last time I said uh, we have two different formulas for the variance. Uh, yeah, you can think of the first formula as the definition of the variance. And the second formula uh, that would be kind of a derived expression. Uh, now I want to show you the derivation of that. Um, if you see this derivation for the first time, it uh, may be a little bit overwhelming if, if I go through it quickly, but uh, let me say that this is going to be in the notes. So uh, then, yeah, later on, you can take a look at the notes and you can think about uh, these individual steps. Uh, I don't want to spend that much time on it, so I am going to go quickly. And if you have questions, definitely, I will be able to answer the qu th those questions. That said, uh, if you are not really comfortable yet, with this uh, framework for statistics and the notation and stuff like that. It's perfectly fine uh, if you need uh, a little bit longer time on your own when you look at the notes. And of course, I will be happy to answer questions also after that. Uh, then, uh, yeah, another question. What is the motivation be behind, behind knowing the shape of the distribution? So it influences a lot of things. Uh, I'm going to have some data examples that I want to show you uh, a little bit later today. So then we can talk about uh, concrete situations where uh, you may care about the exact shape. Now, there may be some situations where the shape doesn't matter so much. Maybe you only care about the mean and the variance. Uh, maybe the skewness and kurtosis are not going to influence your decisions or the behavior of the model that much, uh, but it really depends on circumstances. So sometimes, sometimes it is a really big deal that your distribution is very far, say, from the normal distribution. And then, okay, question, why doesn't it uh, affect the skewness uh, or kurtosis? So here, I'm not sure um, I'm not sure about the context, but uh, but yeah, if you are talking about the shifts and the rescaling, then yeah, you can just uh, take the formula, uh, perform some shift, perform perform some rescaling of the original variable, uh, write it on a piece of paper, and then convince yourself that you get still the same uh, skewness and kurtosis. Yeah, so in, in the case of rescaling, right, right. <clears throat> if you, yeah, let's, uh, let's think about the skewness, for example. Uh, let's say that you define a new random variable that is 10 times x. Uh, in that case, the, uh, this uh, third moment is going to be 1,000 times bigger. 
but the standard deviation is going to be 10 times bigger than the standard deviation of x. So sigma to the power of 3 is going to be 1,000. And the numerator and the denominator both are going to be 1,000 times bigger. So you end up with the same skewness. So that's uh, kind of what I had in mind. Similarly for any of these normalized uh, nth uh, central moments. Yeah, th thanks for the question. Uh, but uh, yeah, I said I wanted to provide some derivation here of an alternative expression for the variance. Uh, <coughs> it's something, well, the formula that, that we derive is used all the time. So even if you don't uh, really pay attention to these uh, individual steps that I'm going to walk you through, it's uh, important that you know the end result. So yeah, just uh, two different ways of uh, writing the variance. So let me attempt to go through this quickly. And uh, yeah, actually, uh, before that, uh, one more question. Uh, skewness and kurtosis makes sense to me, but beyond n equal to four, what information would be helpful to derive as uh, n become larger? Okay, so that's a great question. Usually people don't talk about these higher moments, like the fifth and sixth moment and so on, unless you actually talk about all, all of the moments at once. And, and there's also a way to do that. Uh, but uh, yeah, like intuitively these uh, higher moments, uh, they would measure things that have to do with fairly extreme values of the random variable X. And uh, we will also have a different way of looking at it. So close to the end of the meeting, uh, I would like to also discuss the exact tails of the distributions. So yeah, beyond skewness and kurtosis, you, you may also want to think about the so-called tail index. So, so something that uh, I hope to cover uh, by the end of today's meeting. Uh, all right, so as for this uh, formula, so this was our original definition of the variance. Uh, I just wrote here, instead of mu, the expected value of x. And uh, yeah, this is squared here. So I can also write it as a product of two terms. And we can expand this product uh, like this. So we get uh, three terms in here and we, we are computing an expectation of that. And uh, assuming that this random variable x does have a well-defined expectation and does have a well-defined uh, variance or like a, also the row second moment, uh, we, can, we can kind of split this expectation in here. Uh, the expectation is a linear operation, right? Uh, we defined it using some summation. We defined it using some integral. In those two cases, we considered so because of the linearity, we will be able to split this into three different terms. So first, uh, second, third. Now, if you look at the middle term, this uh, E of X, uh, that's just a constant number. It's no longer random, right? So there's no randomness uh, in here. It's just the mean of the distribution. So you can think of it as a constant. Uh, two is also a constant and constants we can just take out of the expectation. So we can take this two, we can take this expected value of X, we can put it in front and what remains inside is just X. So we have expected value of X. So using this consideration, we can rewrite the middle term. If you do that, if you substitute for this, you obtain this uh, new version of the middle term. Now you recognize that this product of expectations here is actually also expectation square that looks very similar to the last term. It's just that we have minus two in here and we have just uh, one uh, in the last term. So there will be some partial cancellation and these last two terms together give you simply minus expected value of x squared. As for the first term, we just uh, keep it in there. We don't manipulate it at all. And then finally, this uh, expectation can be also written as mu using our notation. And that's our 
uh, formula in here. So uh, the, this alternative formula for the variance, which is often very useful, can be derived using these individual steps. Uh, now, yeah, maybe some of you may need to take a look at it uh, on your own, but uh, do we have any questions rel uh, related to this derivation here right now? Okay, uh, then let's uh, think about the intuition behind the different moments and have some pictures. Uh, let's uh, think about visualizations of the contributions uh, to the individual moments. And uh, specifically, let's uh, think about the first moment first. So what is this picture in here? Uh, what I plotted is uh, the PDF of the normal distribution. I didn't have to pick normal distribution. Uh, you, you can take any other distribution in here, but uh, yeah, the Beige curve, that's the PDF of the normal distribution. And then I, uh, the blue line in here is just X, right? And uh, you remember that in the definition of the first moment, what the definition of expectation, uh, we had X times the probability. So uh, you may want to take the X, so that's, that's the blue line, and uh, multiply it by the probability P, so the PDF in this case, the, the Beige curve, and their product is a function that you can plot. And that's the one that I plotted here. It's the green, uh, green curve in here. And then when you integrate this green function, the result is going to be the expected value. Uh, in this particular case, the expected value is going to be equal to zero because I had the PDF nicely centered around zero and it was a symmetric normal distribution. Uh, but uh, yeah, really kind of the area under the curve of the green function is equal to the first moment. So of course, uh, if the function is more positive, uh, then you will have more positive uh, expectation. And uh, then uh, yeah, let's take a look at the second moment. So in the case of the second moment, uh, it makes sense to plot here a parabola, right? X squared. I think what I plotted here is not exactly X squared, but uh, some rescaled version of that. And uh, then, yeah, again, we have the PDF here. Uh, we have something proportional to X squared plotted here. And uh, you would be multiplying the X squared and the PDF, this will produce a function, that's the green function that you see right here. And again, uh, the area under the curve here corresponds to the variance of the distribution. And um, yeah, you see that uh, compared to the first moment, the green curve has like a significantly large values away from the origin. Yeah, I mean, like the magnitude of uh, the green curve is uh, quite big, a little bit further. Now, if we go to the third moment, it's the same kind of logic. So this time the blue curve is uh, something proportional to x cubed. And then you multiply this x cubed and the PDF, you obtain the green curve. And you see uh, close to the origin, there are almost no contributions to the third moment, which ultimately translates to the skewness. And the contributions to the skewness come from the parts of the distribution where the values of x are quite large, are like quite, quite far from the, from the mean. Yeah, by the way, in these pictures, I'm, I'm not making any distinction between the central moment and uh, the row moment simply because I picked a distribution that is uh, a mean zero. And then, uh, yeah, uh, we would have also this fourth moment in here. And you see that uh, this blue curve that's proportional to x to the power of four is almost zero in the middle. So the contributions to the uh, kurtosis or to the fourth moment, they come from 
places where X is actually very, very large. I have uh, one more way of looking at the same pictures. Well, not exactly the same, but uh, like one more picture uh, that, that illustrates the same idea. But uh, any questions about this? Uh, okay, a uh, question. Is the area negative if the green curve is below x-axis? Uh, exactly, exactly. So uh, you can have positive skewness or negative skewness because if the green curve is below zero, you get negative contributions. Uh, but if, if you're thinking about the variance or the fourth moment and kurtosis, uh, this is always going to be positive. And uh, uh, yeah, right. Uh, so in response to what you say here in the chat, indeed, if you have the nth moment, you would consider x to the power of n. Uh, so one more, uh, one more picture here, and I have a dynamic version of that. So uh, here I use the Johnson's SU distribution, which actually reminds you, uh, reminds me that uh, I should show you the definition of the distribution. I think uh, I did not do that the last time, uh, but uh, yeah, one more picture. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting a question here. How to think about this particular case where the uh, PDF is not symmetric. Let me switch here to the dynamic version of the picture. So this is uh, the Johnson's uh, SU distribution. Uh, at this moment, the parameter values are such that the distribution is symmetric. It has zero mean, it has a zero skewness. And the purpose of this visualization is to understand the contributions towards the skewness. I said that the skewness is not going to depend on the mean of the distribution. So if I shift the distribution left or right, uh, yeah, the contributions don't change because yeah, ultimately skewness is based on the central moment. Uh, but uh, if I change the shape of the distribution by introducing some skewness, uh, then you will see the picture changes quite a bit. So here I'm introducing a negative skewness. And uh, what does negative skewness mean intuitively? It means that uh, there's actually a significant chance of fairly large, or fairly large uh, negative values. Uh, like much less than mean. If I had the positive skewness, uh, it would be the other way around. And then there would be some significant chance of getting values of x that are way above the mean. And uh, yeah, not, not so many way below the mean. So then we have an asymmetric function. The skewness is not going to change again if I change the mean. So I can shift this, in fact. Uh, to set the mean uh, pretty much to zero. So yeah, in this particular case, we have a distribution that has a mean close to zero, uh, but uh, you see it's kind of lopsided, right? Uh, you will have actually substantial probability of getting something below the mean, uh, but not uh, extremely below the mean. And here we have some reasonable probability of getting values substantially above the mean. And then, uh, yeah, what is the green curve? Uh, here we would uh, think about the third central moment. So we will take x minus the mean, uh, we raise it to the power of three, and the blue curve is proportional to that. And uh, then the green curve is, uh, the green function is obtained by multiplying the PDF and the blue curve in here. And you see that uh, we get some substantial contributions here from the positive part, uh, simply because there is a big chance that, there's a reasonable chance that X is substantially above mean. And uh, then the area under the curve here is very big and positive. Uh, here it's, well, smaller and negative. So in the end, we end up with a positive skewness in here. So that, that's, the, that's the logic of the contributions. 
And again, the higher the moment, uh, the more important are the parts of the PDF, parts of the distribution where X is substantially different from the mean. Um, okay, and question, uh, why is skewness towards negative when increasing skewness value? Um, I guess uh, maybe the question is about the shape of this PDF. Uh, so, um, yeah, let, let me let me answer here my interpretation of the question. So at this very moment, the mean is basically zero. That's that's what I adjusted here, and uh, you know that uh, there's a quite big chance of getting very extreme value of x here, uh, like substantially above the mean. Uh, then if the mean is to be zero, you also need to have something below the mean. But uh, it should not be extreme because we have positive skewness. And uh, yeah, that means you actually have fairly large probability of getting something below the mean. Uh, yeah, so really the, the mode of the distribution here is in the negative part. Uh, all right, so, so this is uh, some visualization in here. And, uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I should show you here also the definitions of the distributions. Uh, so the Johnson's SU distribution, if you look at the notes, you will, you will be able to see a lot of these different pictures. Uh, but uh, yeah, this uh, Johnson's SU distribution uh, would be obtained from the standard normal distribution uh, as follows. So you would take Z that just follows the standard normal distribution. So uh, mean zero, a variance of one. And then you perform a transformation in here. Uh, you uh, subtract the number gamma, you divide by number gamma, then you apply a function uh, that's uh, the hyperbolic sine function. So it's a fun special function defined using exponentials. You multiply by one more parameter in here, sigma. And you can also include uh, some mu. You get a four parameter family of distributions in this way. And yeah, the Johnson's SU distribution here is simply the distribution of x that you see. And uh, yeah, I guess I showed you uh, some of the pictures the last time. Uh, yeah, take a look at it. Uh, try to understand if uh, the values of the different moments make sense to you. And uh, yeah, there's uh, also another, another distribution that I would like to use for visualizations. It's a mixture of two Gaussians. And it's basically two normal distributions. Yeah, imagine Two, uh, two variables uh, drawn from the normal distribution, and then you flip a coin and you decide which of the two values you would like to take. So that's a mixture distribution of Gaussians. This is uh, for kurtosis that's quite low, so 1.5. Uh, this is for kurtosis 2.5, and this one is for kurtosis almost three, so if the two Gaussians actually become almost just one Gaussian, then it's not surprising that the kurtosis is going to be equal to three. So yeah, I have a dynamic version of this visualization as well. I may want to show you as well. But uh, yeah, question, uh, what do different parameters mean in this distribution? Uh, right, yeah, let me show you in the dynamic version of this. Uh, it's uh, probably easier with that. But before that, uh, one more question. Are we using Johnson's distribution here as it might be easier to get PDF based on the values to define different moments? Um, yeah, I picked this particular distribution, the Johnson's SU distribution, simply because the visualization looks kind of nice. And uh, yeah, you can also get explicit values of these individual moments. So it's uh, easy com to compute the moments of the distribution. Uh, maybe this, this is something I could uh, include in the assignment. For those of you who don't mind uh, doing some elaborate 
analytic calculations. Uh, maybe you may also have fun computing the moments of this uh, Johnson's distribution and so on. And, uh, and uh, yeah, actually, um, uh, about the number three for kurtosis, I picked two different distribution, uh, two different classes of distributions here because uh, one of them has uh, kurtosis below three and one of them has kurtosis above three. So the Johnson's distribution, it's uh, this one, we, we looked at it last time. You can have uh, like fairly low kurtosis above three. You can have very high kurtosis. And then if you take the mixture distribution, it really corresponds um, it really corresponds to two Gaussians. And uh, I have one parameter that's uh, like the mixture parameter. If I set this equal to one half, uh, then uh, we are going to get a distribution that, uh, that has uh, the two Gaussians weighted equally. Uh, I have a parameter sigma in here that uh, measures the, var well, the, the variance of each individual Gaussian. Uh, then I have mu. So that's just shifting the mean. And the delta that corresponds to the distance between the Gaussians. So if I set delta close to zero, we are basically going to get just one Gaussian, or I can separate it. And you see that the kurtosis in this case is actually pretty low. Uh, I can get very, very low kurtosis if I separate the Gaussians well and then I decrease the variance of each individual Gaussian. So then we get the, the kurtosis of one. And that's in fact the smallest value of kurtosis that you can possibly get uh, for distribution. So yeah, these are some visualizations here. And I see I'm actually not doing very well on time. Um, let me think. Um, all right, uh, I definitely don't want to skip uh, kind of the fun questions. So it might be, it might be that uh, we will have to leave the discussion of the tails of the distributions for some other time. Uh, I would like to, yeah, maybe I need to include it in one of the future sessions. Uh, but uh, yeah, let, let's just uh, let's just uh, take a look at some data examples and see what happens to the moments there. Oh yeah, before that, uh, I also want to explain some terminology in here. Uh, yeah, if you have a kurtosis greater than three, so if the kurtosis is above the uh, kurtosis of the normal distribution, then that's a leptocortic distribution. So it's uh, like this one. So a little bit pointy in the middle, right? And uh, the mesocortic distribution that would refer to distributions that actually have kurtosis equal to three exactly. And then you can have platycortic distribution, which corresponds to kurtosis uh, less than three. And uh, platy here refers to something being flat so let me try to show you what, what looks a little bit flat about platycortic distributions. So not, not this visualization at this moment, but uh, I'm going to change this a bit. And yeah, now you see the top of the distribution, uh, top of the PDF, a little bit flat, right? So that's uh, what Platy refers to in the term. So we have a platycortic distribution if the kurtosis is below three. And uh, yeah, so having covered this uh, terminology, I, I just want to ask you some questions and uh, I would be curious to hear uh, your answers to these. So yeah, let's uh, think about uh, portfolio returns. Obviously this is not a finance class, so if the terminology doesn't sound uh, like completely natural, I guess 
yeah, I guess it's okay right now. Uh, but uh, yeah, let, let me read this question and I would like to hear your opinion. So suppose that uh, you can only invest your money in a single asset. You cannot mix assets. You don't have any extra money anywhere else. You only can invest in one financial asset. You don't have any additional income and uh, you don't have... Uh, yeah, you don't have any sources of income in the future. And let's uh, think about this as a two-period problem. Today you invest and uh, maybe uh, 10 years later uh, you collect your money. Uh, so you want to invest over this uh, horizon. And uh, yeah, let's say that you need to choose between two financial assets. You can have the first one or the second one, but uh, not both. And let's say that the assets uh, have the exact same mean and the exact same variance of returns. And uh, what I mean by return is uh, yeah, how much, um, yeah, how, how much uh, extra money you are going to have if you invest in that uh, particular asset. And uh, yeah, let's say that uh, one of these assets has a positive skewness and the other one has a negative skewness. So the portfolio returns have either positive or negative skewness. And uh, yeah, that's all you know. So uh, you, you don't know about any additional details of all of this. And my question is, which one of these assets would you want to choose? The one that has positive skewness or the one that has negative skewness. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so, so people say uh, positive skewness sometimes. Uh, sometimes people answer negative skewness. In fact, uh, some time ago when I asked this question to people, uh, they suggested that they would want to have an asset that has a negative skewness. Uh, yeah, basically the logic was that for negative skewness, uh, the curve would look a little bit like this, like the beige one. And uh, I said that the mean is the same. So let's uh, set the mean to zero. And uh, yeah, some people look at the beige curve and they say, okay, look, uh, if, I, if I invest here, I have a pretty high probability of getting um, yeah, getting something below this particular mean, right? Um, so for that reason, sometimes people answer that... Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so for this reason, sometimes people say that they don't want to have a positive skewness uh, portfolio because quite often they would be losing money. Uh, but uh, this is actually not, not the right answer. Uh, the right answer is that people would actually, uh, people should prefer a positive skewness return here because uh, if you have a negative skewness uh, return, so if the curve, uh, yeah, if the curve looks like this, then yeah, it is true that quite often you would be gaining, uh, uh, you would be gaining money, but then there is a chance of getting some completely disastrous outcome, right? So this uh, particle distribution with negative skewness has a high probability of something that's very, very negative, and uh, that would be a situation where you maybe lose half of your money or something like that. So or maybe ninety percent of your money, and that would be. Uh, pretty disastrous. So yeah, if you can choose, uh, you should really prefer in your investments positive skewness assets, if you can, assuming that they have the same mean and the standard deviation. Uh, that's actually important, right? So the mean matters a lot. But uh, if you compare two things that have the exact same mean and the exact same standard deviation, then the positive skewness uh, case is actually better. Uh, so that's uh, one, uh, one situation. I, I have the answer here. After careful consideration, uh, people would actually choose the positive skewness 
asset. And uh, yeah, as for kurtosis, I, I guess I'm running out of time, uh, but uh, yeah, let, let me say that a similar logic applies to kurtosis. Uh, if you have two assets that have the same mean, same variance, uh, same skewness, you should choose the one that has a lower kurtosis. And just uh, as an illustration, uh, these are uh, returns uh, if you invest if you invest it in the S&P 500 uh, index, uh, particular index fund, it's not all adjusted here. Um, so this was uh, from uh, 1995 to the end of 2021. And this is the histogram of weekly log returns. So yeah, you, you see these uh, kind of disastrous situations where within a week uh, the portfolio uh, or, or this particular asset had a very very uh, negative return. So because of these events you would have actually a negative skewness in here and that's not something that investors would particularly like, right? So this was associated with some stock market collapses of uh, 2008 and uh, 2020 and so on. Um, yeah, so this uh, skewness in here was actually minus uh, 9.5 and Cortosis 11.7. And uh, uh, yeah, a question uh, is, it, is it kind of that uh, the risk you take increases in the case of higher cortosis. Um, yeah, so I should say that the cortosis here basically means that you can have fairly big surprises, uh, either positive or negative. And uh, well, I suppose so. we are pretty much running out of time. So if, if you need to leave, then uh, feel free to leave. But uh, here, I would like to show you at, at least uh, uh, one more picture. Unfortunately, the tails of distributions, uh, that's something that we will have to leave for some other time. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's nice to look at some pictures. So I have a question here related to income distribution. So, so not uh, the income distribution of individuals, but uh, uh, let's say that uh, we think about different counties, so different administrative districts uh, within the United States. And uh, for each county, you would calculate the mean income in there uh, per capita. So yeah, overall, how rich the people are in terms of income. So if you heard about this distribution without actually seeing it, uh, what would you say about the skewness? So do you think this distribution would have a positive skewness or a negative skewness? Uh, okay, great. So most of the answers here are positive and but uh, yeah, we also have some, some negative answers here, like a negative skewness answers. Uh, let's uh, take a look at the actual pictures. So, so my answer here is uh, it's uh, positive skewness. And I have here a picture of that kind of histogram. Uh, specifically, this is the mean, uh, uh, mean income in US counties in 2017. And uh, you see the distribution really does seem to have a positive skewness. So the positive skewness again uh, comes from values that are substantially, substantially above the mean of the distribution. And uh, yeah, here the skewness is actually 1.1. But the cortosis is also different from the cortosis of a normal distribution. Uh, so 4.4 in this case. And uh, then, yeah, you can ask uh, what, is, uh, what is responsible uh, for the skewness in here? Uh, well, there are basically these uh, very 
uh, rich communities where the incomes are fairly high. So it could be uh, maybe in the Bay Area, could be in New York and so on, where the incomes are high. But uh, one needs to actually also keep in mind that, of course, uh, this extra income in those counties does not necessarily translate into better standard of living uh, because yeah, the real estate there is also very expensive and uh, maybe services are also very expensive. So this is not adjusted for any kind of uh, price index. This is just nominal. But uh, yeah, as for uh, the nominal income distribution, uh, we will have here positive skewness because there are a couple of places that are uh, very rich in the nominal terms. Uh, yeah, would higher kurtosis suggest higher income inequality? Uh, income equality? Well, I would say it uh, would suggest uh, higher income inequality in a sense. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so you meant inequality indeed. Uh, Right, so you would have these extremes. So if you have things, if you have uh, values that are very, very extreme, then uh, yeah, you can say that you have higher inequality. But of course, it depends on you how you decide to measure uh, the inequality exactly. And then, yeah, I guess uh, I went through these uh, questions uh, really fast. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get to these other topics. So, so what are some topics that uh, I would like to discuss at some other occasion? Potentially it could be next week, but uh, more likely we will choose a different topic. Um, oh yeah, maybe this one I can mention actually right now. If you are interested in these different shapes of distributions and if you actually want to have some more motivation to think about uh, what the shapes actually mean in practice. Uh, take a look at these books. Uh, so so Nassim Nicola, uh, Nicolas Taleb is uh, pretty famous and his uh, writing is uh, pretty good. So you may want to check out books like uh, Fooled by Randomness or The Black Swan. So there he really emphasizes that the shapes of distributions matters a lot for practical purposes. And uh, yeah, what we will have to cover some, some other day, um, yeah, that will be the tales of distributions. Yeah, in, in that uh, extra session, I will talk about characteristics that have to do with, with the very extremes of the distributions. So yeah, maybe before some other session.